So, a very big topic today, going back to our beloved early Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. We're gonna talk about Visigoths today and uh, the councils of Toledo, which um, is basically, um, you know, um, about the process of conversion of the Visigoths to Catholicism, um, the difficult process, at least initially, which brought to these um, assemblies, to these ecclesiastical councils, that had a huge importance, not just for Spanish history, but also for um, the whole um, Western Christendom, and not only, telling the truth. Um, it's a topic that is often not discussed. Um, I don't know very well Spanish history myself, but this is one of the really big things about uh, the early Middle Ages, and uh, I never hear it discussed, or um, or I, I, I think I, I, I didn't find on the internet any other video talking in depth about this topic. Um, I think it's quite interesting, uh, first of all, uh, for the context, the historical context, that is the Iberian Peninsula during the... Um, essentially, we're, we can still... W yeah, we, we are technically in the 6th century, but, um, you know, Spain was um, one of those lands in, in, in Western Europe, such as Gaul, that basically didn't... Um, undergo a uh, brutal change from the late antique uh, society to the early medieval one, if there is such a thing. Um, in general, it's a matter of um, economical and demographic contraction that uh, happens all over Western Europe, but that it's um, mm, you know, much slower um, such as in these cases, or much faster, like, I don't know, in Italy, for instance. And this brought um, many consequences. Uh, we're not going to discuss that. Um, we're going to discuss what happened um, in the political and religious um, uh, asset of the Vi Visigothic kingdom um, um, from a political and religious point of view. During uh, the sixth and seventh centuries, um, basically the situation was that uh, the Visigoths, uh, during the sixth century, after having lost um, Aquitaine to the Franks, um, basically centered uh, their own um, um, power uh, in the um, heart of the Iberian Peninsula. They still own cer certain certain territories in southern Gaul, um, such as Septimania, which is uh, the area of um, uh, today's um, Languedoc, uh, um, um, Carcassonne, that, that area, which was called in this way because uh, it, it could be um, crossed uh, on horse, I believe, on horseback um, in seven days, um, but this is just detail. But the important thing is that, in spite of the um, Byzantine presence on this very southern um, coastal area of Spain, the Visigothic kingdom basically uh, ruled all over the, the Iberian Peninsula. Eventually, the, even the Byzantine areas were absorbed by the Visigoths uh, at a point that we don't even know mm, mm, in, in practice because we don't have a huge quantity of information with what was going uh, out there uh, in the early Middle Ages. Um, and um, and the, um, the, the organization of this the Visigoth kingdom, Visigothic kingdom resembled basically the one of the other Romano-Germanic um, kingdoms. And there, were, um, there was a, a Germanic social vertex uh, made up of the Visigoths and a uh, Latin population, Latin for language, they were Romano-Iberians in practice. And um, 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 and, and it was 
very importantly based on the cooperation with bishops. Uh, the Visigoths <coughs> were um, like you know the other gods m m converted from paganism to Arianism. Uh, unlike the Franks, that were actually an exception in the Germanic mm, landscape of uh, the migra migration periods, um, um, they they converted to Catholicism only later. Um, so at this point, the Visigoths were still Arians, religiously speaking, um, and uh, and the Arian faith uh, of the Arian say mm, religious organization at least obviously um, comprehended the uh, bishoprics and an episcopal system that as you know uh, in, in late antique period um, in the late antique um, world was mm, of crucial importance for the management um, of uh, the local populations from from a strictly uh, mundane worldly point of view was a very important tool for politics and in this case for Visigothic Kingdom. Now the problem though is that um, the um, that Spain unlike other areas of of Europe um, and especially ones of Northern Europe that basically uh, were still largely pagan in spite of the penetration of, of Christianity um, uh, would make a bit of a resistance to the Aryan fate. Um, you know that Aryanism was adopted by mm, the German and uh, the German peoples. Um, you know, for for many reasons we we don't have time to explain this, or so we'll make a video about it. Um, but let's say it was a, a sort of a s m very often a sort of very superficial um, adherence to Christianism. First of all, Arianism, as you know, was um, an heresy of Catholicism, and, um, and and the Germans didn't care much about it. That what they wanted really was to, you know, have a face of, of you know, of, of a, uh, you know, of Christian uh, identity in order to um, be accepted in the relationships with the uh, with the Romans, the Roman Empire. But it was much more, you know, a sort of alibi, alibi to, um, you know, keep being pagan and having uh, a very unorthodox uh, conception of Christianity. It was normal. Um, the problem for the Visigoths is that they had occupied an area that uh, not only was quite, quite um, intensely Romanized, because Spain, uh, especially in the southern part. Uh, central and southern part was very strongly Romanized, not much the north, um, even after centuries of Roman domination. Um, <coughs> and um, um, but, m but most of all, was uh, Spain was one of the areas where Catholicism had spread mm, the most, um, you know, in Western Europe in in the Roman Empire. So the population was largely Catholic and especially the population of the cities uh, as it was normal let's say in this time was uh, Catholic. Um, the countryside was like in other parts of Europe still retained uh, very um, very uh, still politeistic beliefs I, it was normal but since Spain was built uh, politically uh, and administratively around cities and the wealth of cities was really what made the Visigothic Kingdom, uh, as much as the Roman Empire in the past, uh, work. Uh, the Visigoths had to deal with with Catholicism, and especially the fact that they were uh, they didn't have the upper hand because when they arrived in arms, these migrating people that could impose its will and theoretically, th it, it was always, um, uh, um, you know. A, a moment of negotiation, um, negotiation with um, the uh, the local populations in terms of um, uh, religious, uh, let's say, tolerance. But it's at least the idea that there wouldn't be any 
um, active persecution because it would have been stupid to be enemy with the local population you want to rule that incidentally was was huge you know the Visigoths were uh, when they arrived in southern Gaul and northern Spain were you know mm, um, some tens of thousands of mm, warriors plus yes of course the, the other um, you know female population and kids and, 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 and old people but the um, the Spanish population, the Iberian population was much larger we're talking about millions at this point um, so you understand that from a demographical point of view <laughs> there was a very few chances that um, with uh, with a you know strong um, very um, uh, deeply uh, Catholic population of millions of people uh, the Visigoths could impose their Aryan faith um, and this was the problem of the King Leo the Gild. Um, so we are in an advanced stage of um, the mm, you know the, the Visigothic kingdom. Um, Leo the Gild um, uh, or Leo the Gild, you know, depending how how you wanna to um, to call him in English. Uh, we are in in the full sixth century. Mm -hmm. He was born in mm, 519 A.D. Um, and his problem was, you know, that obviously the, the Visigothic kingdom had had developed um, in a situation in which even the Visigoths were uh, getting mixed with uh, the Romano-Iberian population, and Catholicism was obviously um, on the rise. Um, this was normal. Uh, the Franks had understood it immediately, they had behaved otherwise. The, the Visigoths were proudly Aryan, um, for especially for political reasons, and they had opposed this um, Catholicization of their own, um, their own people. Um, because they still considered themselves as such, even if it's exactly during these times that uh, the Visigoths were even, you know, starting to conceive um, mm, you know mm, more th the local po mm, you know not any more a difference between the local population and the Visigoths who were even juridically speaking trying to make a uniform um, 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 group um, for obvious reasons because it was also simpler to uh, to rule um, such a population and um, um, and, and one of the uh, problems that Le Leuvichild had uh, was that his um, his son um, um, Hermenegild had been um, so you know the the hair I believe uh, was the first born or at least the one who was supposed to to eventually rule as um, and uh, as he didn't tell the truth, um, and he had been converted hmm, by a very influent um, figure that is uh, that was the um, uh, l um, Leander. Um, a very important uh, character in in the uh, religious landscape of you know of the Iberian Peninsula because he was the um, the uh, bishop of Sevilla um, and um, which was a very big city, a uh, very important one in southern Spain. It remained so throughout the whole Middle Ages. Um, who was uh, incidentally uh, the uh, member of a very important and great Romano-Iberian family. So you understand that it's, it's quite a bit of a problem if you are an Aryan king um, uh, um, of the Visigoths in this case and your son, so the one who is supposed to rule after you, um, gets converted to Catholicism 
influenced by one of the most influenced Roman families uh, that um, are in fact Catholics and are um, fighting against you. Um, a very great victory that witnesses, by the way, the importance of the romano iberian senatorial class in, in Spain, uh, going back to what I was talking to you about before, that is uh, the fact that Spain had still a very largely functioning um, Roman system. Mm. Um, it hadn't been destroyed and Roman families were 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 quite strong, and uh, and what happened uh, very dramatically, <laughs> let's say, is that Hermenegild rebelled against his father. Uh, now I don't go into details, but obviously the c the religious part was, mm, you know, the religious uh, element was was quite an important one because it had huge political implications, as a matter of fact, and he rebelled to his father, Ludwigild and he was killed. <laughs> so, um, uh, problem solved? No, not really, because um, uh, Leo Vigilt, um not happy of having killed his son in this rebellion, wanted to stress um, as a response uh, even more the um, um, the, uni the religious uni unification of, of the Iberian Peninsula, of the um, vi Visigothic Kingdom, but <laughs> you know, stressing the um, the faithfulness to the Arian, to the Arian uh, credo, the Arian doctrine. Um, and it was a bit of. Um, um, you know, it's, it's not that Louis Gilles was was an idiot that so that things weren't, um, you know, weren't working, and he 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 tried to deny the problem and force himself, because in history we get, I think, too often these very harsh judgments. But I must say that studying history in depth shows you that, uh, especially those who were in charge were always doing something for a valid reason. Mm. And the valid reason here seems this, that uh, even though um, you know, the Visigothic Kingdom was from the other side of the Mediterranean um, uh, compared to the Roman Empire, uh, Constantinople still had very, um, very um, active uh, aims towards the reconquest of the world Mediterranean. This is the time, same time in which, in fact, the Byzantines reconquered um, uh, North Africa, um, Sicily, Italy, and even part of southern Spain. Um, Byzantine influence was very strong all over the Mediterranean. Uh, certain cities of southern Gaul that technically should have been closer to the uh, the Franks still minted, f for instance, um, you know, Im imperial coins. So the, the, the presence of the Roman Empire and the chance that Constantinople could take back um, even part of uh, Visigothic Spain was a very concrete uh, danger for, for Leo and, um and I think it was a very, you know, um, reasonable uh, expectation that as in the case of the Ostrogoths had proved you know the Ostrogoths ha had always uh, were had been conquered by the, the Byzantines uh, were being conquered by the Byzantines at this time and uh, the Ostrogoths had always had very strong ties with the Visigoths they um, at a point even had um, um, a sort of um, they, they made from Italy, uh, Spain, a sort of client state during the minor age of one of the Visigothic kings, um, and um, and therefore, which was possibly Leovigil. Um, I don't remember this, um, but I don't think so. Um, and um, and therefore, you know, and, and the Ostrogoths were Aryan too. Obviously, the Romans being Catholic. So it was a, a great threat, you know, the idea that the son of the king could, you know, uh, even mm, 
give space to um, to this option that was by the way strongly supported by the Romano Iberian um, senatorial families because obviously I call them senatorial because it's a sort of um, stigma <laughs> let's say that, that they didn't have a senate anymore there was a senate in Rome indeed but only the Italians belong to that at this point I mean senatorial to stress the the wealth and the importance that this family had even in um, in the late Roman um, social system that really strengthened um, and emphasized social divisions and these top families were extremely ambitious, s extremely rich, they had a lot of estates um, and, and these Roman or Iberian families like the Roman or I Italic families in Italy for instance um, did against the Visigoths for instance um, really hoped that at a point they would come back into the Roman uh, Empire mm -hmm. and they would get rid of the Goths that telling the truth especially in Italy were, were, were doing a hell of a good job and even the Visigoths weren't bad in Spain only this problem in Spain was more apparent uh, meaning that um, the Visigoths um, the Visigothic king had wanted, as we have seen here with Leovigild, to impose a much more, um, let's say, national uh, perspective of um, of rule in many ways, and they wanted um, um, the local populations to fully um, uh, embrace their own um, their own uh, domination. Um, um but um and and as uh, we were saying before the the odds were very very unfavorable to the gods in this sense um uh from a religious point of view they couldn't impose arianism on such a large catholic population uh, Bi the byzantine influence remained confined eventually to southern spain so Constantinople couldn't take uh, Spain back, also because it would have been uh, an extremely, um, you know, expensive task. Because one thing is to regain all the coastal cities that you control with a fleet that basically you are the only one to have in the Mediterranean. Um, and one thing is to enter in the Spanish, in the Iberian. Mainland and trying to fight in those territories, <laughs> the Romans of the Republic knew how harsh um, that in those battlefields could could turn um, to, and and therefore the Byzantines, probably in accordance with the same Visigoths, retained just the control of these um, coastal towns in southern in southern Iberia and the. Uh, the wall, um, the rest of the Iberian Peninsula was, you know, left to the Visigoths, who, by the way, um, didn't have a a very fully homogeneous um, low uh, territorial control over the Iberian Peninsula. At this point, the the the, the core of the Visigothic kingdom was basically around Toledo, which was to was the Roman Politum. So in, in the first, in, in you know, in the very center of the Iberian Peninsula, but even the north, or even Lusitania, that is today's Portugal, were, you know, uh, qu quite uh, quite uh, tough to bring under uh, the royal uh, rule, and there were a lot of wars, even in the following centuries, to try to keep these guys under the Visigothic um, uh, kingdom, but they, they, they were sort of elusive and think also that in northern uh, Portugal and in Galicia there, there were also the Swabians that had migrated there so a very much more um, um, uh, I, you know a diversified uh, situation and not just you know the idea ah, the Visigoths had Spain point no um, it was still a very fragile dominion also because these mm, mm, German peoples didn't have a very strong tradition of centralized rule and even the local Roman administration was progressively declining so the idea of keeping all things in balance was uh, was not easy at all 
um, and um, and however the project of Leo Vigild to make of the Visigothic Spain an Aryan um, kingdom uh, failed um, there had been um, uh, a previous failure um, that could show the, the, the Visigoths how things could go, which were, were the Vandals. The Vandals who weren't at all the terrible barbarians that uh, were depicted by, by the Roman Catholic tradition, um, had however tried to impose on uh, North Africa a fully Aryan um, episcopal uh, system to the local Latin churches and they had failed. Uh, so it would fail also in, in Visigothic Spain. I, I must say in that in Ostrogothic Italy there, there wasn't this repression, you know, there was a quite happy coexistence between the Catholics and the Aryans, at least mm, until the end of the um, of Theodoric, but th there weren't um, these um, attempts to make of the um, Italian episcopal system an Aryan system by the Visigothic uh, by the Ostrogothic ru rulers, but this is another chapter. And um, the son, the other son of Leovigild, that succeeded to him eventually to um, uh, to, to the throne, um, let's say in a figurative way and became king of the Visigoths, uh, finally uh, changed um, direction and took the opposite way. Uh, he decided that uh, the Visigoths had to pass to Catholicism. And, um, and this is um, what he imposed at this time on his own people, the Visigoths and the Visigothic bishops also. And uh, he was not very gentle against uh, the opposers, uh, because obviously there were some Visigoths that uh, uh, didn't maybe just see it as a political direction, but even maybe believed in Arianism, or they hated Catholics so much that they didn't want to convert to Catholicism. Um, Recared um, really um, repressed them all. And um, and in fact, this Aryan resistance had a very you know mm, was very short lived, and um, the solemnization of the um, uh, of the uh, conversion of the uh, Visigothic king and of his people was um, um, uh, um, um, sanctioned in the um, uh, Council of Toledo in 589-80. And the Council of Toledo was um, a very important thing in, um, Visigothic, in the Visigothic world. Um, a very, very important one for one reason that it wasn't much of a religious um, thing. You know, obviously um, the councils of Toledo sanctioned the victory of Catholicism and of the Romano-Iberian uh, aristocracy on uh, on the the Visigothic Aryan uh, rule in a way, in the sense that the Visigothic uh, the Visigoths, as we have seen, decided to um, you know to um, conform to uh, the religion of the Iberian population. But um, I, um, the councils of Toledo had a much more political meaning for the Visigothic uh, kingdom. And they, ke and they kept it very strongly because uh, we will see that here. Um, they would have a great impact on the history of Western Christianity during the early Middle Ages. This was quite an important thing, and we will explain later why. Um, um, and um, the um, the importance of this, uh, first of all, how was it structured? Um, well, um, this was a council where 
theoretically all the bishops of uh, of the kingdom would participate together with the Gothic aristocracy. I say theoretically because we said before that the political unity of the Visigothic kingdom wasn't um, wasn't most of the times, um, <laughs> you know, very um, um, a very solid one, um, and um, and therefore not everybody would come, and the same council of Toledo would become a sort of um, of a political thermometer. Can we say that um, to show how many um, uh, you know um, mm, you know because it was a, ma a matter of aristocracy. It's let's be clear here Wh when we talk about bishops, we're talking about. Um, aristocrats mm, they weren't bishops, you know, raised from nowhere. These were always uh, members of the most important Romano-Iberian aristocratic families, and and with even with the progressive weakening of the Visigothic um, um, uh, monarchy, uh, this council took even the upper hand in some uh, political affairs. Mm, the bishops, so the uh, at this point, Gothic Roma uh, Romano Gothic Iberian <laughs> aristocracy would, um, you know, even decide to whether to depose or to elect a king. Uh, at that point, um, uh, because the Visigoths had retained, by the way, also part of their original Germanic uh, tradition of electing kings and not, you know, sanctioning the passage of, you know. Um, the establishment of a dynasty. Hmm? Here we have seen from Luvili, Luvigil to Recared, yeah, we're, um, son, uh, we're, we're father and son, but you know, it, it wasn't always this way. Um, and, um, and I'm not saying that this wasn't um, a religious um, assembly. It, it indeed, it, it dealt with very important uh, religious uh, matters. Uh, it emanated the canons um, that had, um, first of all, the objective to disciplinate uh, the, um, together with the uh, ecclesiastical organism of Visigothic Spain, the whole life of the peoples. And I'm saying peoples at plural because as we have seen, that there weren't just the Visigoths there, um, under um, the um, Catholic tradition. Mm -hmm. So it was a sort also of control of the um, full Catholic Christianization of the Iberian populations. Mm -hmm. As we have seen, it was the triumph of the um, um, of the cultural influence of the aristocracy uh, of the Romano Iberic and uh, aristocracy um, uh, under this episcopal cover let's say it's very fascinating and um, um, it was indeed um, also uh, a moment in which um, very big personalities um, could influence, um, you know, the whole cultural Iberian landscape. Let's think, for I for instance, um, of uh, the preeminence of uh, this council of the extremely famous, famous um, um, Isidore um, of Sevilla, hmm? who was um, one of one of the greatest scholars of, of the early Middle Ages, the author of a great um, 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 a, a very large erudite um, uh, encyclopedical uh, uh, production, works production, and um, and that would influence um, ultimately the whole medieval culture in the West. Uh, Isidore of Sevilla is considered one of the greatest authors. Um, uh, let's say he, he wrote a, 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 a Catholic encyclopedia, if you want, uh, with which all the greatest um, ecclesiastical scholars would 
and not just them would uh, you know would have to deal when when looking at the past and and, and of the uh, world conception that had been uh, shaped by um, by these works. Um, so we're talking about even of um, of characters at the Council of Toledo that that had a very substantial cultural um, a, a, a very great education because this is the, r the really important one. Here we are in the early Middle Ages, at the end of the late antique era uh, in the Mediterranean. And, and these guys were essentially the last great minds, I would say, in terms of um, intellectual production. It's not that there weren't great minds, obviously, in the early Middle Ages, but in terms of late antique erudition and quantity even of material that they could um, consultate, for instance, because we, we don't have to forget that many uh, many works that uh, uh, of that came from the classical world were, were still there at that time. Many had already been lost, but uh, this was a time in which those people had books that um, part of which they copied and they write um, straight to us in this sense, but of many other um, uh, works that uh, they knew, but we, we don't. Um, so it's a very fascinating um, moment also for the history of, of European culture, what happened in Spain um, at this time. And the Latin West, anyway, would be definitely uh, influenced by it over time. Um, but I think that um, uh, one of the most intriguing um, aspects of uh, the Council of Toledo were the um, the meaning that um, the new institution uh, represented um, um, not just for the um, for instance for the mm, mm, nomination of the new bishops that was an important thing politically speaking but it was mainly uh, obviously um, con you know confined to the Visigothic kingdom um, within the, the, the Visigothic kingdom but even the international importance that um, that it that it had um, why because uh, this council uh, was for very first um, of all a very big one you know it was rare that in, w in Western in the Western world um, in the Latin West there would be such a big council with such personalities and, and number of bishops um, participating um, there, there weren't even in Rome at least there, there were or in Italy there, there were in minor parts Italy in this time was being ravaged by wars and Constantinople sh surely had um, uh, ecumenical council during this time. Uh, by the way, busy to justify, <laughs> more or less justify heresies to keep a balance and a control over um, over the Near East um, uh, for reasons that uh, the people who know about the history of <laughs> Eastern Christianity obviously uh, know very well um, but you know um, there wasn't much else you know in the Latin West so in Western Europe at this time uh, the, the, the Visigothic Council was the most by far the most important um, and um, and this was quite meaningful because you 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 have to think that Rome for instance that always maintained the um, the um, the uh, this, mm, the record of of charity, let's say, <laughs> the supremacy in terms of center of Christianity, because being the seat where you know Peter and Paul uh, had been martyrized, and um, you know mm, obviously. The, the Roman bishop had already by this time a, a very great um, political importance but 
um, it wasn't, uh, you know, we're not in the 11th century. Uh, there wasn't still the idea that the center of uh, the Western Western Christianity would be Rome, but there wasn't still the idea that the center, that th 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 there was supposed to be a center of Christianity in this sense. You know, Rome was still conceived uh, w was as a sort of a symbolic seat with a preference, let's say, that uh, obviously uh, its history had conditioned, but um, here, the for instance, the, 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 the Spanish bishops said, you know, if we make a council here, it still has an importance and could even overcome the one of Rome. Same had happened uh, in, uh, in Africa, for instance. Uh, I mean, th there were various um, uh, poles around which um, you know Christ Western Christianity um, was um, w was shaping, and, and there was a lot of competition between Rome, Carthage, and and Toledo in this case, and Constantinople, of course. So it wasn't uh, it wasn't obviously said that uh, um, in the end Rome would emerge as the leading center of Christianity from you know, from a political point of view. It's true that in this time Rome was already um, expanding uh, her net of control over Western Christendom, especially think about the evangelization of the Anglo-Saxons, you know, this relationship with very distant parts of Europe, and Rome was not under a Germanic kingdom like Toledo was, for instance. Um, but this didn't mean that it was, uh, that the Council of Toledo was less important, because, in fact, and this is the, the amazing thing, um, um, the, um, the, the Councils of Toledo were a moment of political celebration of the Visigothic kings. Um, the Visigothic king would be called Sanctissimus Princeps, that uh, in Latin means the holiest um, prince, um, and Orthodoxus Rex, which means Orthodox king. And according to you, which model were these guys um, following? They were following the Roman imperial model, they were following the model that was taking place in Constantinople. Which means um, um, that the Visigoths had a name that was not just uh, a name of mm, territorial unification of the Visigothic kingdom, but it was also a name of creating an empire. Um, the Iberian Peninsula, as we have seen, was from fragmented in various peoples, so there was even this idea that the Visigoths would be just one of them ruling over the others, a bit like the Anglo-Saxon would do with the British islands, islands like saying, you know, yeah, we are the Anglo-Saxons and we rule over um, the, the Romano British people, uh, o over the Picts, over even Ibernia. Sometimes they even enlarged it to Norway, uh, even if in later times, but just nominally. Um, and here the Visigoths were doing the same exact thing. They, they thought n not only they, they could be a kingdom, but even an empire, uh, wi with, um, with an ecumenical council that could sanction the holiness of this empire, and therefore drawing from it their, uh, their uh, um, self-legitimization in a sort of sense. And, um, and Visigothic kings acquired for instance, the um, holy um, 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 the uh, the holy anointing of kings mm, um, of biblical inspiration, but that was also part of the Germanic world because certain kings in the Germanic world had managed to you know get this holy anointing, trying to stress their sort of divine uh, nature uh, against this egalitarian traditional mm, you know mm, mm, asset of the Germanic society um, and um, it was creating even the council was even creating the symbolical premises 
afford domination over churches. What does this mean? That these guys in Toledo were uh, thinking of what um, the Roman emperors were doing that were basically becoming protectors of the churches and becoming an authority that could um, go beyond the same church organization. Sure, thi this was a council and the council was even becoming more powerful than kings and therefore the the comparison here is more interestingly done with Rome you know as Rome uh, with the Gregorian form after here five centuries um, would mm, shape and sanction this idea that Rome was the center of all uh, of all Christianity and all the other churches were subjected to it which was a very um, uh, it wasn't a new idea because we have seen <laughs> we are seeing it um, being done here and even um, differently in Constantinople but it was something very revolutionary at that time well here in at the councils um, of the Visigothic Kingdom it was already being uh, formulated it's already it was already being um, thought and uh, it would have eventually expanded obviously if the Visigothic Kingdom had survived more probably um, and I think this is re really very 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 interesting um, and um, um, we see that um, um, this council obviously also strengthened the Visigothic identity at least uh, not much the, Visigo the uh, Visigothic royal power that again we see it, it it's gonna crumble over the years very slowly but you know uh, at the eve of the Arab invasion of Spain uh, the Visigothic kings didn't basically control even 30 miles out of Toledo <laughs> but the the council of Toledo was extremely powerful and it had a much broader net why because it had stressed the unity of the Visigothic people Obviously, the Visigoths weren't a compact entity um, either. Um, I mean, they were fragmented in these... Uh, there were all these dukes, essentially, mm, that were lords fighting against each other. Um, but there would be a control of these dukes over royal power. So, in this sense, stressing the Germanic root of the royal election, meaning that there wasn't a dynasty that had to rule but the king had to be chosen by the assembly of the warriors and stuff. But even strengthening this idea of being a unique people, mm, um, that eventually, um, you know, this Visigothicness, if we can call it this way, really was embraced by a lot of other um, uh, people there. First of all, the same uh, Romano-Iberian um, aristocracy that we have seen was prevalent, but it obviously had interest to be um, 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 how do you say equalized, let's say, compared, equated to the um, Gothic aristocracy because mm, the Gothic aristocracy traditionally was seen as at least the one that had subdued Spain and that ruled over over the local populations, uh, but also but also by um, these other lords that I think about the ones that were in northern Spain or even the Swabians in some measure that that would that could participate to this big uh, enterprise of 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 the the kingdom at least for for how it was being formed you know the idea of in in fact in this uh, sense belong um, participating to to this council through the bishops that they could send from their own territories and that they were their relatives in most of the times and um, however, uh, we must say that uh, the Visigothic Kingdom was in fact declining as such. We see that um, at the beginning of the 8th century, so 
at the eve of Arab conquest, the, um, the late antique uh, society was basically disrupted. Mm -hmm. There had been um, um, a brusque um, interruption of the late antique society, but obviously there had been a decline which, uh, which had made the um, the um, the the uh, had made declining the uh, the the class of freemen, for instance, that it's always an indicator of the um, economical wealth of of a kingdom. It's true, though, that the um, um, the the large estates that belonged to aristocracy in the Visigothic kingdom did not collapse. On the contrary, they expanded in some measure. They surely suffered from economical decline as well because you know the the, the traffics in the Mediterranean had contracted. Uh, there was much more of a you know local net of um, trade uh, than there had been at the beginning, even in sixth century. I mean this circuit that traditionally um, was was present in the Mediterranean, um, it wasn't much of the Arabs that caused this uh, contraction, but, you know, the world decline, the demographical decline of, of Europe and the general impoverishment, maybe even the climate played its part, you know, these, I these are the very vague yet important um, causes of the decline of uh, the late antique world. Um, and um, in, in general, we see that more or less, obviously, the, the w what could be Visigothic at, uh, at the beginning, um, a few was was left in, in in actual political power. You know, it was the Latin aristocracy that basically expanded these estates, that became more powerful, and that eventually became the the Gothic. Uh, what we call the Gothic element, and as we've seen, the, the kingdom was was quite a of a weak thing as the uh, the fall uh, into uh, under the Arab domination um, eventually proved. Um, however, there is also a model we can do in here. Here, the Visigothic kingdom, as you know, ends violently. Uh, in 711 under ma the Muslim uh, invasion. But there was another people that were the Franks that I like very much to talk about um, because they are very interesting. And we can say that, that even if the Wi Visigoths created this very big thing of the Council of Toledo um, and um, they managed to at least formally convert um, the kingdom from Arianism to Catholicism, at least the elite, the Visigothic elites, because as we've seen, the populations were were um, were Catholic already. Um, there was another people that actually made it to create a very a much more coherent and um, and clear asset of collaboration between uh, the uh, royal. Um, institution and the Episcopal system, and these were the Franks. Uh, the Franks in, in comparison were winners, indeed. Um, they, uh, they immediately shaped their own kingdom uh, that, that was much more of an empire, telling the truth, um, uh, at least uh, at the time of Clovis, because and and to to expand Catholicism accordingly, you know, the many Aryan populations were eventually converted by uh, by the Frankish uh, domination. Um, and we can't say that um, the the Franks, in this sense, immediately built a system that eventually was adopted, even if slightly modified, especially in terms of balance of political power and episcopal power by the Carolingians eventually. And that, however, fully worked. Um, the, the Council of Toledo was the expression of, 
of a much more complex system and I would say I mean I wouldn't say much of a more complex system but of it was a result of a of a weakness of the Visigothic uh, kingdom since the very beginning the Visigoths had um, weren't many first of all um, and they they had suffered dramatically fighting uh, from a demographical point of view fighting for the Romans and even um, and they had even been about to be reconquered back by the Romans at, uh, at the end of the fifth century uh, think of the campaigns of Majorianus you know the if, it the if the Vandals hadn't defeated the Romans probably Rome would have uh, reconquered Spain from Italy at that point and the Visigoths would have mm, been taken away and sent to uh, maybe to, to fight as federati uh, in, in one of the most remote angles of uh, corners of the, of the Roman Empire. This didn't happen, but the Visigothic Kingdom was quite a, a weak power from that point onwards. Uh, the Ostrogoths from Italy were uh, capable of, of placing a sort of... Uh, um of protectorate over them because they were the biggest and most powerful entity in the Western Mediterranean. They could m they could make it. The Visigothic Kingdom made definitely some progress in terms of juridical um, organization of religious organization here we have seen, but they uh, and even if they, they they managed to shift after the defeat against the Franks in Aquitaine. Um, the center of their power in the central, uh, in the center of uh, the Iberian Peninsula, they always had a huge trouble at controlling the world um, the geographical area, and eventually ended to become a very b weak power. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I can't help myself to, but to see that um, the emergence of the Toledo's council was um, the proof of um, a political weakness of the Visigothic kings in some measure. Uh, in some measure because obviously there was the intelligence of a king like Recared for instance to convert to Catholicism and this uh, could have brought the premises for for an enlargement of, of the same royal rule but eventually for for dynamics that were, according to me, more social and economical and demographical rather than strictly political. I mean, I'm not saying that it was the fault of the Visigothic kings, but I I'm, I I'm, I'm saying that the Visigothic kingdom as a system didn't have a huge potential, uh, not even in the, in the best uh, conditions. So, in a certain sense, I'm not sure whether it had to fall necessarily to the Arabs at the end, we know, for instance, that the Jews uh, that had been persecuted very harshly by the Visigoths, and this is something very, uh, very bad if you <laughs> think about it, actually preferred to, mm, to uh, mm, you know, to to help the Arab invasion to get rid of the Visigoths rather than the remaining under their rule. So I think if the Visigoths had been less concerned about this uh, Catholic orthodoxy at all costs if they had thought at not at creating an imperial um, ideology that they couldn't cope with uh, for their chances and they had tried to strengthen their power on a strictly regional scale over the Iberian Peninsula maybe we would have had um, no Reconquista maybe the, the Spain would have been unified mm, much earlier Maybe through these councils um, uh, there would have been a, a fierce opponent to Roman supremacy uh, in in the religious sphere of the western of the Latin West. When I say Latin, I mean Latin from a linguistical point of view. So even you know I'm talking the whole Western Europe, uh, not Latin from a supposedly allegedly ethnical point of view. I'm, t I'm talking about, you know, these the world Western Christendom. And I think, and I want to conclude with this because it's been very long, <laughs> my God. 
um, that um, that Rome, when uh, you know when when Spain was conquered uh, by the Arabs, um, many Sp uh, Visigoths um, fled. Uh, first of all, to the northern mountains, mm, um, that obviously uh, were you know the place from which eventually the the kingdom of uh, of uh, Leon was formed and Reconquista eventually started. Um, but many, um, especially many literates and, you know, mm, e ecclesiastical people, for instance, fled to Italy. And there is a very interesting story that I can't tell now, but uh, let's say that um, it's very interesting to see how, that how Rome um, tried to uh, eliminate, to delete, any memory of the um, um, Visigothic clergy traditions and customs that were different from the Roman one, from the Roman one, S and which which is what we were talking about before. You know, the idea that uh, the Council of Toledo was shaping the identity of a new um, church with dif were with a different liturgy and with different beliefs even um, um, in different relationships between political power and religious power well Rome um, basically made uh, converting all uh, these um, Visigothic refugees to their uh, liturgy even the guys in northern Spain that were obviously asking for help to the rest of the Christianity when the Arabs had conquered almost everything in the uh, Iberian Peninsula basically um, accepted anything that Rome was able to impose um, and this is very interesting because we're talking about the, the, the first half of the 8th century so um, a moment in which the Roman Church was, was putting the premises for a territorial rule and even the aid was shaping even at least partly this mm, attitude of being the first among the West, even if it was fully developed century after centuries after. So it's it's all the more meaningful to see that um it was a great worry for, for Rome to um to get rid of these um Spanish competitors um in the um you know in the conception of um you know mm, what the church had to be and liturgy and relationship with politics and so on because in in Spain something really new had been created and um and there had been quarrels as a matter of fact with Rome even during the Visigothic kingdom in this sense because the council of Toledo decided something and Rome said no that's not good and Carthage said, well, mm, w that, mm, you're, you're both wrong. And Constantinople said, oh, we don't accept you. So it was a much of an um, ideological war and a great uh, production of, of material, by the way, um, much of which I think it's lost. But, I mean, the, um, the acts of these councils were normally... Um, conserved, they were kept somewhere, and, and 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 I personally know people who study exactly these topics, and there is a universe behind these things. I mean, historically speaking, uh, you you can see in these early Middle Ages, wi which is supposedly uh, you know a dark age, what was the uh, degree of mm, even of theological um, exegesis and of um, of mm, political or originality and uh, and even uh, if you know it, it amazes you what how strict the contacts were between mm, and thanks to the church uh, within Europe itself uh, so fine it was, was a very long video um, I hope you liked it because um, you know I, I, I think I put in a bit too much I should <laughs> make um shorter um uh, shorter rambles <laughs> but um these are extremely fascinating topics and i i tell you i'm talking about these because i don't 
hear them told anywhere and this is like it should be like the ABC of, uh, of for of any medievalist of anyone who, who likes the Middle Ages who appreciates the Middle Ages um, if you don't understand these processes you think just Middle Ages is you know the ones of your country and that you know it's about all about castles and uh, yeah and then uh, a few kings that's not Middle Ages that's uh, comic stripes <laughs> Real history is um, an extremely complex thing and um, we really have to talk about it because we really have to grow with it. So thanks for the patience for listening to me if you arrived to here. I remember you to, first of all, I tell you for the first time ever, please share this video if you liked it. Um, and you helped me um, keeping doing videos and you help me possibly in this sense uh, talking with you and if you have any curiosity whatsoever any question just um, post them on the comments or um, write me and I, I might make a video response to your question so this can um, uh, put things in motion and hopefully build uh, um, a great community around uh, around uh, Schwerpunkt. Thank you once again. I wish you a nice uh, day, night, <laughs> whenever you are. Bye.